speak to you again. Y'all have been so gracious. Uh, way more kind than you had to be about the things we've talked about so far. Today we're going to talk to you about what may be the most important thing for us today. We are leaking. We are losing people at unprecedented numbers. We're losing primarily one group. You may notice that if you travel around in lots of congregations, our congregations are getting older. Amen. It's because we are losing our young. And I don't know how we can ever be satisfied with that fact. I am a, a parent and a grandparent, also a child psychologist. And it breaks my heart to see so many young people not seeing the church of Jesus Christ as their home. And brethren, we got to stop. I think it's fitting that we're here in this room. Not long ago, I was in a congregation, I'm not going to give you the name because Russell will probably know it's a preacher. He's one of ours, trained with us. But I was at his congregation afterwards, it was close enough for my whole family to come. And my whole family is a little weird. I have my two sons, love my boys, faithful, strong, and true. I have my daughter-in-law, she's better than anything we ever deserve. And I have two grandsons. And I love them. And I have nine other grandchildren who don't look exactly like me. Amen. They're from all different colors, all different languages. We're a beautiful composite of what the whole world looks like. So I took them with me and they were having a potluck meal. And one of our young ladies they said, okay, you kids can go first. So she went running up there, and one of the church leaders there grabbed her by the arm and said, not you. We want to make sure everybody gets enough food. We don't want anybody eating up all the food. And she came up to me and she said, Grandpa Chris, they don't want people like me eating their food. And Grandpa Chris was a little upset. And I said, point them out to And Alan said, Dad, it's not worth this. And I said, son, when were you allowed to talk to your daddy that way? Amen. <laughs> Little JoJo was told she can't eat. Somebody's going to tell me why. So we went up there and he said, well, you know, some kids get in the way and they make messes and eat too much. And I said, you're an elder of the Lord's church. I'm a preacher of the gospel. There's never a day in our lives where we will be more saved than we are right now. It's not about us. We are heaven destined. It's not about us anymore. It's our job to bring others into the kingdom like this little girl. She's with me. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, honey. Come on, I'll help you get a plate. And I said, no, wait a second. She was just as valuable when she wasn't with me. And he said, you know how these kids are. And I said, I absolutely do. They're the hope of everything. We live in a dark, purple world that uses and abuses children all the time. But glory be to God. For every one of them wants to come to the church potluck and eat the food. Right. I mean, having them be with us, we take them to the children's Bible hour, and some of them act one way and some the other way. Thank God they're in the building. Amen. Because we need them. The church needs them. And they need Jesus. We're going to read a passage together. It's up here on the screen. I'll read it with you. It's from the English Standard Version. It's 1 Timothy chapter 4. I hope you don't like mind a lot of Bible reading. We're going to read the whole chapter together. But this is where Paul is talking to a young man named Timothy. 
he's going to tell them, I know that some people won't listen to you because you're young, but you keep saying it anyway. And he talks about how times are going to get hard, but you are to stay faithful regardless. Let's read together. Now the Spirit expressly says in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons, to the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. Nothing can be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, for it's made holy by the word of God and by prayer. He says in this part, don't act like God made bad. Amen. God made it good. And there's going to be a time where a bunch of lying people filled with demons and evil spirits are going to go around saying everything's broke, nothing can be fixed. You need to keep doing your work regardless. If you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you follow have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. As he knows, promise for the present life and also for the life to come. He says, we've got to keep this stuff out in front of the church. Or else we're going to get distracted. We're going to follow, start following silly things. Listening to those kind of things. And we've got to stay tuned in to what God says is of great value. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to public reading the scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. We know from history of this time the church didn't really tolerate young preachers much. Sort of sad. I began preaching when I was 14, but I do realize I didn't know much then. He says, dedicate yourself to reading the Word of God, saying the things that it says. But even at that time, people were talking about Timothy saying, he's too young. He said, you live the right life in front of them. You read the right message, the Word of God. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy. When the council of elders laid their hands on you, practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you'll save both yourselves and your hearers. I have been doing a three-year study in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Louisiana. That's a pretty big group. This study comes from about 600 or 700 young people who have left the Lord's Church, and then there's some, about the same amount, who have stayed faithful in the Lord's Church the whole time. There are five reasons. Well, there's several. There's a bunch of reasons. These are the top five reasons why people, young people who grew up in the Lord's Church left. The first one is, my congregation preaches and teaches about loving everyone, the focus is only on loving like-minded people or people far away. This hurts my feelings as missionary. Some of the young people that left said, we've got unsaved people all around us. Y'all are real interested in sending someone to Africa, <laughs> sending someone to Asia, but you're not that interested in reaching out to people just across the street. I didn't think young people were that perceptive, did you? We talk about how much we love all the people around us. And they're saying, why are we ignoring so much about this? Next is, my congregation offers few opportunities for giving feedback and openly discussing ideas. They say, well, I don't get this part. How come we can't do that? And people say, now be quiet. Hang in there. Do what you're told. Everything's going to be fine. And i got to tell you, with my generation, that was pretty effective. 
When my dad said, because I told you so, I said, that's exactly right. Amen. How can anybody not agree with this logic? We are now raising a generation, and this is people up to 35 years of age, primarily people 18 to 35, who are saying, it's not good enough to tell us where our opinion doesn't matter. It's not good enough to tell us we're just supposed to do exactly what we're told. We actually want people to tell us why we do something. I was at a congregation the other day, and they said, we're having a problem with our young people. They all want instrumental music. So I went to them and said, what's your deal? And they said, well, we've been told it's wrong, but nobody knows why. That doesn't make a lot of sense to people. They just wanted to know the reason. So I talked to their Bible class teacher, and he goes, well, I'm not really sure. Somebody needs to tell them. My parents attend worship, but don't seem don't seem to see it as important like we should. They learn from their parents that church is a place you go, but it doesn't really do much. So they're wondering why they should even go. I talked to a young man the other day, and he said, "We miss church for every baseball game. So I guess if I was going to worship something, I'd worship the game of baseball because it was the most important thing to our family." And I looked at him and thought, well, replace that with rodeo and you have where I grew up. If we want our children to be faithful, we're going to have to show them that being faithful is of great importance in our families. Our relationships with other Christians and other religious groups seem more real and genuine than relationships in my congregation. Now that one just hurts my feelings. They go to other religious groups and they talk so much about God and prayer and love and all these things. And they come back and they don't feel like it's a strong here. That's got to hurt us. Finally, my congregation being critical of technology rather than embracing the positive ways technology can be used. I was presenting this in a congregation and the preacher got up. His introduction was, I don't understand Twitter. I can't tweet. I don't know what's going on with it. He was laughing. I'm one of his friends on Twitter. He uses it all the time. But it's sort of cool to make fun of technology when you get to be in your 50s like I am. Kids just think it makes you sound like you don't know much. And you're out of touch with what they think. They said, we'd like to know more about such things. Young people are leaving the church in record numbers. But I don't think that's the last part of the story. I think the Lord's church is going to rise up and win them back. I think we're going to keep most of them. We just need to wake up and realize that we've been leaking children into the world. And that's not good enough. And if we want to save our country, we're going to start by saving our young people. Amen. That's so important. But this is more positive. For those young people who stay and are past the age of 35, they've been faithful all the way through, this is what they answered, answered the questions I gave them. First one was, my family makes a priority of worshiping and studying God's Word in our congregation, so I'll continue to do this in my life. That's the story of my life. I saw my parents, how seriously they took all this, how important it was to read and know the Word of God and those things. So. I got involved in the family business of knowing the Word of God. It's the way it's got to be. Next one, my congregation knows who I am and is interested in what I think and feel. If we brought in the youth group, would you know them all? Know them by name? Know what they like? Know what they do? It's important that we know those things. My congregation provides opportunities to serve our community. And help those in need. The congregation I work with in Rhode Island just put in a soup kitchen. They wanted to help the homeless. What they didn't realize when they were just about to quadruple the size of their youth group. Because they saw them doing something like that and they responded. My congregation is dedicated to biblical truth and it's the right place for me. Now Russell, that's what we want them all to say. Amen. We want them all to say, hey, biblical truth, that's what we're looking for. There are young people, that's what they value. Amen. Thank God for them. 
I pray their number increases. And then finally, my congregation provides opportunities for me to develop relationships. They want to know people. Surprisingly enough, they didn't want to only know people of their age group. They wanted to know older folks. They wanted friends. People they could talk to. People they could go to for help. Brethren, it's hard to bring in enough people through the front door. It's hard to bring up people that weren't raised in the church, that don't know anything about the church, to meet them, talk with them, get them to agree to a Bible study and teach them the gospel of Christ. Bring them in the front door is really hard. So we can't let people go out the back door. Over 80% of people that leave Lord's Church have something in common. They're in their late teens or in their 20s. We can't afford to lose them, can we? Plus, they also represent some special people. Like my kids. How many of y'all have kids that are teenagers or in their 20s or younger 30s? How many of y'all are willing to give some of them up? I mean, right now, we're saving about 40%. How many of you are willing to give up one of your kids? Anybody? Just one. That's all we're asking for. Right, we've got to take this serious. We've got to realize that when we start talking about rebuilding the world, changing our world, and rebuilding our country from the ground up, it's got to start inside our families. Amen. It's got to start right at home. And I really always thought that at some point, I'd become a grandparent, my job would be over. But that's not the way that works, is it? Amen. Gavin was at the pulpit at the house the other day and he was preaching a sermon. <coughs> he was telling Captain America, Flash, the Hulk, telling all these guys. Grandpa wants all of you to be saved. I looked at him and thought, I really don't care about superheroes that much. But Gavin, you've got to go to heaven. I'll do whatever I gotta do. Sell whatever we gotta sell. Take whatever job we gotta take to see those two boys walking in the heavenly places. Amen. It absorbs me. But then there are my grandchildren at the children's home. One little girl is just about to start school, but she's been raped hundreds of times by her family. And we got to save her. One girl literally carries scars on her back from a foster family that didn't like the color of her skin. She's the one that got turned away during the church pop-up. Mm -hmm. But we've got to do everything we can to get her to the heavenly places. Amen. You have so many beautiful children here. We've got to get them there. Whatever it takes. And i got to tell you, a mom and a dad, I don't know if they can do it by themselves. If they ever could, I don't think they can do it today. There's too many voices in the world telling kids so many hard things. More voices in their ears than I ever had when I was growing up. We've all got to join together. Families joining families. Working to raise the next generation. And then when they're faithful and older, there's going to be more come in all the time. It's going to be the work of us to keep them all. It's another change in the world I don't understand. When I was a boy, almost all the children in my youth group stayed faithful. 
the same church that I grew up in. Now it looks completely different. Kids get busy. They got lots to do. They make other friends. All the excuses we can give. We act like we weren't born. But Paul told Timothy, the world's going to get wild on us. It's going to get wicked. Even religious people start lying to you and drawing you away from what's true. All sorts of horrible things are going to happen. But you have got to stay faithful. And you've got to reach out to others and help them stay faithful. Because the world is not going to be easy. The world is instead going to be hard. And you've got to make it through. My family was converted in Swinford, Ireland. My grandparents, my great-grandparents, all converted there on the Green Coast. Um, I love to go back there, but it makes me mad my family wasn't welcome there. When they were converted to Christ, our Irish Catholic family uh, put all their stuff in the yard and set it on fire. Because they had promised the Catholic priest that they would raise their children Catholic. And it was something they took very seriously. They came across in a slave ship to New York. They went through processing in Ellis Island. They were turned loose on the shores of New York, and every building they went to said, no more Irish. See, we had an immigration problem at the time. All these Irish people were coming and taking all the jobs. So they went down to Boston. Because in Boston, they loved all the Irish. But the signs were there too, no more Irish. No jobs for Irish. So Charleston, Virginia. Charleston, South Carolina. Then down to Gainesville, Florida. Then down to Miami, Florida. Then up into Georgia. Everywhere they were told, there's no room for you. Finally, they came to the land of promise. <laughs> came to the state of Texas. <laughs> and they said, we will give each man Seven acres. You don't get to pick it. You get it assigned. These act, this acreage was in a place called Burt Burnett, Texas, between Wichita Falls and Burnett. There were 11 boys. That was a lot of land. And all they had to do was improve on it, and they'd get it. My great grandfather lived to be an old man. And he would tell us, we left our country because we were faithful to God instead. Never forget. We came to this country to be faithful. If we have to give up our home a million times, we're faithful. And he would have us go and stick our hand in that dirt that weird reddish colored dirt. Pick it up in our hands and say, we'll always be loyal to the country that gave us a home. But we'll always be loyal to the God that made us leave our first home. Amen. Unfaithfulness is not allowed. Well, it worked that way for a while. But I've got cousins who don't stick their hand in the dirt. They don't declare their faithfulness. But me, every year I take my sons back to that dirt. We stick our hand in it. This past year was the first time I took the grandsons. And I told them, there was no room in this world for the Irish until we came to Texas. Feel that dirt between your fingers. It's the price of faithfulness. We will be faithful. Everyone's got to stick their hand in the dirt wherever you are and say, we'll be in this place and we'll be faithful. Every parent has to look in the crib and say, you may never play football, you may never have a great job, you may never do all the things that every other parent dreams of, but I just want you to be faithful and go to heaven someday. It's got to be who we are. 
Every Bible class teacher, everyone here is part of making that dream come true. Let's leave no kid behind. Let's take them all with us. I know this is a really unusual lesson. Well, I've been accused of being a little unusual. But I do think, it's all right, they end the truth. But I do think that we need to start looking intently on what we're going to do to make our world better and what we're going to do to change this place. What you're going to do to change this place is you're going to pray for your leaders. You're going to share the good news of Christ with those around you. And you're going to stake a claim in the hearts of all the young people that come through this place. And you're going to help them stay faithful. And as you reach out to others, you're going to keep them faithful. And ultimately, this community will be a different place. You'll turn on the TV, it'll talk about problems in other parts of the world, and you'll go, whoo, glad we don't live there. Amen. We have to change the world. I'm excited with this Mission America thing. But for it to work, we're going to have to keep our kids. We sing the song, How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thankfully, I didn't have to secure my heart and guard my life from sin. I had a dad. I guarantee you, he guarded my heart. I guarantee you, he pointed out sin all the time. We weren't going to have anything to do with it. Some of you did too. Amen. It's got to be a family. In Africa, it takes a village to raise a child. This is your village. You've got to raise your children. By way of invitation. If you're a parent, I want you to know I'm praying for you. I hope you'll take this time just to rededicate yourself to your children. Whether they're sitting on your lap, whether they're driving your car, or whether they're living in some other city making a living. I hope you'll dedicate yourself to saving them secure in Christ. I hope as new children are born and the Anthony family is planning on providing you with lots of these children. <laughs> I pray that every time you see one, you'll take it as a new opportunity Amen. to keep folks faithful. If you've never obeyed God, you need to do so. But if you're like me, You've been faithful. You live for Christ. You're saved by the blood of the Lamb. Start focusing on someone else. <clears throat> Stay faithful. And begin to work on the faithfulness of others. Dedicate yourself to them. If you need the prayers of the Lord's Church or there's some way that we can help you, I hope you'll ring up the message. Uh -huh.